Hi, this is Manjula Narayan, books editor, Hindustan Times, and today I have with me Yan Mater, and everybody knows, uh, you know, Yan Mater, and you know, you, his books have, uh, are immensely popular, and you know, The Life of Pi is, was a big blockbuster film as well, and he won the Man Booker Prize, and Margaret Atwood says it's a terrific book, so on the cover, so mm. well, you know, so it's like a modern classic now, and. Um, uh, but what I was interested in is um, the germination of the idea and like we all know that you know you read a review um, of another book a Brazilian book with a maybe the you know the bare bones of it was the same but it's a completely different book mm -hmm. and I was interested in knowing you know how ideas can spark from anything you know and your book grew out of that life of pie well I've read of many things it, that review by this Brazilian writer where the premise was someone in a lifeboat with an animal, like Noah's Ark, but boiled down. Yes. But that in itself did not. I read that seven or eight years before I actually wrote the book. So that was just one strand. Most of the book was brought by coming to India. And that was happenstance. I was following a girl. And it didn't work out with the girl, but it certainly worked out with the country. <laughs> I came to India, and um, you know, India is a wonderful, terrible place. It's, it's all of life in one place at one moment. There's so many stories possible uh, that I just added one more. So um, that premise, which was just one anecdote, mm -hmm. came to life when I came here. Because what's surprising with India compared to Canada, among many things, is, for example, the presence of animals. In a temperate country like Canada, very few people live closely with animals. Farmers do. Mm. But other than that, animals in many ways are excluded, not just from our daily life, but even from our way of thinking. And one thing that's surprising for Canadians to come here, for example, is the role of animals, because it's a tropical country, so you see lots of animals, literally, but even metaphorically, like for example, Hinduism has a greater presence of animals in it than Christianity does. You know, Hanuman is a monkey, Ganesh is the head of an elephant, every god has an animal transporter, you know, Ganesh has a mouse, uh, 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 Shiva has a, a Garuda. All these animals. Vishnu, noticed, sorry, Vishnu. Oh, sorry, Vishnu is a. <laughs> yeah, Shiva has a bull. Sorry, yeah. sorry, got my Nandi. animals wrong. Um, that presence struck me, that link between the religious and the animal. And that right away you know, goes to the heart of life of Pi, this linking of the divine and the animal. So it was coming here that really brought this story to me. If I'd gone to Sweden, I would have written a very different story. I don't think I would have written Life of Pi, I would have written something else. So it was coming to this country that brought me to think not only about the nature of animals, but the nature of religion. Hmm. Okay, talk about religion, you know, in, in a world where religion has been like, um, uh, you know, has not been lately been a force for good. I mean, people have, like you said, kidnapped it. A lot of negative uh, forces have kidnapped it. But, but this book, you know, at the heart, it's also about the positive, you know, aspects of being religious. You know, if you can talk about that. Yeah, well, um, if you don't like uh, a belief system, you have a ch choice of one of two things. You either um, abandon it or you try to change it. Now, political ideas you can change easily. You can vote for a different party. Um, but religious ideas, you can abandon them or you can try to change them. But to change religious ideas is very difficult because they tend to be very, very old and very entrenched. So the usual route is to just ignore religion, which is what we've done in Canada, for example. Especially Quebec, where I'm from originally, is a very, very secular society. Church attendance is extremely low in Quebec. And that's fine. Women have done better for that. Most religions, in fact, I can't think of a number that isn't sexist, all religions hold women down. It's been kidnapped by a male agenda to put women down and keep them in a state of servitude. So you don't like that, then fine, get rid of religion. And women are far more liberated in Quebec than even in other parts of Canada. However, religion is a kind of magical thinking. And if you get rid of it, you lose a bit of magic in your life. So to, t to throw out religion entirely, to use the expression, to throw out the baby with the bathwater, you're throwing everything out. The bad, but also the good. And so it's perhaps better, although it's a more a greater effort, to try to change religion. And many people doing that. You know, religion isn't just about oppressing women, Jews, and gays. There's other things happening with religious thinking. Yes. 
which is what I came to see in looking at religion more carefully, whether it's Christianity, Islam, Judaism, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism. There's other things happening that are really interesting, of which sexism and homophobia and hatred of Jews is one negative cancer that can be eliminated. Um, and if you do that, then you can return to the kind of magical thinking that is religion that transforms lives in a very positive way. Um, you know, religion is fundamentally moral, and it's helpful to be moral. Yes. If you're not moral, you are immoral, or at the very least, amoral. And that it doesn't bode well for the world if it's ruled by people who are amoral or immoral. Mm. Okay, and what I found interesting is, you know, um, as a person, I mean, Pai is Indian, you know, but, but, but you're not. But you've managed to make him so convincing, you know. And usually, uh, you know, often when you're writing about a character from another culture, you know, people don't usually get it. So how did you, like, I, I'm imagining a lot of research went into it because you talk about the, you know, the backstories, the emergency and stuff like that. So talk a bit about that. Well, I did research. I mean, I, I've, I've been to India now, this is my fourth time. And the first two times I was here for six months each time backpacking. And when you're a backpacker, you're close to the ground. You walk places, you mix with people, you don't isolate. Like right now, I'm staying at the Imperial Hotel. A <laughs> lovely hotel, but it's a bubble. I'm not really in India. I'm in this bubble of luxury, uh, which could be anywhere. When you're a backpacker, there is no bubble. You're face-to-face -face with India. That's true. And that's lovely. So in total, I've been here about 13 months. And so I did my research. I listened to how Indians speak. I did my research. I read about India. I read about religions. and. You know, the, the art works when you work at it carefully. And so I did my best to sort of imitate, uh, to create this Indian character who hopefully would feel true to, to readers. And, you know, you make the odd mistake along the way, but if you get your reader on board, they believe, and then there you go. You've, you've achieved your aim. Um, but it was an artful construction, and I'm glad it worked. It wasn't an obvious thing. But, you know, what's wonderful with India is, despite it in many ways being very exotic, it's a very accessible exoticism because it's, you know, it's terrible what colonialism to India, but the one thing it gave India was the English language. And what's interesting about India is anyone with the least bit of education in India will speak English, mm -hmm. which means it's a door that opens and you can understand India more than, for example, China. Very few people speak English in China, and so China is impenetrable because the language is such a barrier. Mm -hmm. All the languages of India, you know, the 250 languages of this country are a barrier, but most people in this country are bilingual to some yes, extent. That's true, yeah. And that means, as a foreigner, I can suddenly, I can talk to them. I can read their books, I can, I can talk to them. So it makes it a much more accessible um, uh, foreign place to a foreigner than otherwise. Mm. Okay, and one last question. You know, uh, th this idea of there being different realities that you've played with in, in the book, you know, talk about that. Well, um, <clears throat> and subjectivity, and you know. Well, we're, we're subjective beings. You know, um, reality isn't just what it is. Of course, there are facts. If I walk out of this and I have a car crash and I end up in a wheelchair, that is a fact I can't escape. But what I make of that fact is entirely up to me. So there is a subjective reading of reality that is always there. And that's what's wonderful about it, is that you can read reality differently. And what I like about religion is the same thing what I like about art. Art transforms your existence. You look at a great painting, you listen to great music, you read a great novel, it changes who you are. You look at reality differently. Religion does the same thing. So just take an example that I'm more familiar with. That, you know, if you're a Christian, the Christian sees life through the lens of Jesus. This character from 2,000 years ago Christians try to emulate, just as Hindus would try to emulate Krishna. In fact, it's interesting how Krishna and Jesus have that same kind of personality of loving kindness, openness to humans, curiosity, kindness. This is much commented upon in India. Yes, exactly. Well, you, you read about Krishna, you try to emulate him. You try to be like Krishna. So you're seeing life through the lens of Krishna. And that changes, it really does change your reality. You are a different person th for doing that. So that kind of magical thinking, which is a subjective reading of reality, really does change that reality. And that's why I defend it. I, d I certainly don't defend the aberrations of religion. Those are to be condemned. But that transformation that makes life better, why wouldn't you do that? To me, if there's a choice between believing more and believing less, I would choose to believe more. Now, it has to be a kind of subjective reading that can endure. Subjective readings that don't endure 
where reality catches up to you, well, you have to abandon those. But that's what's extraordinary about religion, is people who are religious who have faith continue to have faith despite adversity. Yes, that's true. And that's what's extraordinary. No matter what happens to them, they still continue to believe, which speaks to how it is a really extraordinary phenomenon. Because one of the reasons I started writing Life of Pi is I was struck how in 2000 there could still be gods around. After all this triumph of science and technology, how could people still believe in gods? There was clearly something there about religion that I wasn't understanding. Hence why I wrote Life of Pi, to try to understand that phenomenon called faith, where you believe despite having no proof. And that's a very unrational way of thinking, but in fact it's a deeply human way of thinking. We want to make these leaps of faith. It's called love. We all want to love, whether it's a football team or a god or a Bollywood star or something. We do want to love something because that helps us make sense of life. And so Life of Pi was just defending that act of love that is the more positive manifestations of religion. Okay. So great. That was like very interesting. Good. <laughs> so, That's the aim of it. <laughs> yeah, nice to have you on the show and good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.